Hey, this is Frank J. Avella, and I'm here with actor, writer, and producer Tom Pryor, a triple threat with the new indie gem, Firebird, a film about the deep love between two military officers that in then Soviet occupied Estonia in the late 1970s, which is playing at Outfest this coming week. Welcome, Tom, and uh, congratulations on a terrifically crafted film and an impressive performance. Thank you so much, and it's uh, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, and on and, um, being selected in Outfest, um, in my Frameline review a few months ago, I called Firebird the best of that festival. And uh, honestly, I think it remains one of the best films I've seen this year, and I see everything. Oh, thank you so much. That's a real, uh, that's a real <laughs> honor to hear. Uh, it seems surprising that such a relationship existed in that milieu during that time until you stop and think that same-sex feelings didn't just recently emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the, the films I know based on um, Sergei Fedosov's memoir. I'm curious, how true is it to the actual story? Well, when Peter and I first started writing uh, the screenplay, um, I actually chose not to read the whole of the original story to begin with, but actually really start giving sort of my interpretation. Um, and then sort of later on, actually got in and dug into the book before we went and met him. And um, it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, specific about the nature of the relationship and the intensity of the relationship. But what our job really was as the screenwriters was, was to make it uh, sociologically and sort of like politically contextual as well. So that when you read the original story by Sergei, it, it kind of almost becomes across sort of fantastical at some points. Um, and exactly as you're saying, asking the question of like, how was this even possible? Um, and so really our job as the writers was to kind of really bring in that context to bring it within the sort of circumstances of the time. Um, but I think also, and you know, a number of people are saying, you know, how can we read the original book? I think that people will be quite surprised in some ways of how much we did adapt the book. And I believe actually, honestly, for the better, for example, Louisa uh, in the original story sort of was a formidable uh, drunk, honestly. And so we actually made it to be, to serve like the, the equal weight and opportunity for all three parties like involved in this, this love triangle, which sort of like exists um, to kind of give the responsibility and the voice to all of those characters, which we felt was really important to do. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to give anything away, but I, I thought that a later scene with her was, was quite powerful. Um, I won't say anything about it though. Uh, here's a question I'm sure you get over and over again. So just give me the condensed version. I know you came on board as an actor and then connected with uh, Peter early on. Uh, tell me about how you started contributing to the writing process and then actually came on as producer as well. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so I was originally um, approached to play, play Sergei and then Peter and I uh, agreed that we would work together and we actually decided to shoot a teaser um, to help raise the rest of the financing because it's a hundred percent uh independently privately financed film um with a significant budget and so when we were doing that teaser uh sequence of scenes i sort of started making some su subtle suggestions on how we could improve some of the dialogue within those scenes and then that kind of really extended to a conversation afterwards about how we could improve the script and how the structure could be changed and how we could really bed in that that um sort of next level of the story. Um, and so then I sort of making more suggestions and then Peter and I sat down for two weeks and started sort of brainstorming and then we started rewriting and then the rewriting process was honestly uh, for about two years that then followed that. Um, not solidly, we were also doing our own sort of careers still at the same time um, and, and sort of doing other acting jobs for myself. but. Uh, yeah, that was really kind of like where the kind of merging came in. And it was a real honor to be able to do that actually as an actor, to be able to be so prepared with the material, having written it, and then, you know, reaching out to the real Sergei, um, going to meet him in Moscow and interview him and, and sort of really get to know him as a person as well, um, was paramount really to both the writing and the acting for me. And then really the producing side of stuff kind of was sort of wiggling its way in all the way through that when it was about, you know, how we're going to finance the production, who we're going to like uh, potentially co-produce with and that 
meant many different meetings in many different countries and potential co-productions with other companies, um, which then again really led to us actually being the main producers of the film along with uh, Brigitte. And um, then really through the production process, it, it was sort of producing as well as like the casting process and, and then helping raise the money. And, and then now the distribution element of it as well. And that's like a whole nother ball game. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a real honor to be like, to be able to do so many elements of it, but sometimes it can be a bit, uh, almost overwhelming. Yeah. We're very, yeah. We're very disciplined about switching off like certain aspects of myself. So we would refer, for example, as, as, as Sergei or, or as, as Tom, even as him during the edit of the film, because Peter and I sat through the edit very extensively and, you know, being very objective about my performance was, was pretty tough. Um, but also kind of very, very much of a sort of growing up experience. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, and Sergei is a, is a real queer empowering character. Um, once he realizes who he is, he actually dares to be himself, which I think is really important in these, these times uh, with human rights violations going on all over the world, including here in, in the States. Uh, the film feels so urgent right now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... Do, do you, while you were making it, were you cognizant of this? Was it something that you, you felt? I mean, not, not that, you know, not as a polemic, but as something that was really, really important to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's always been very important that the, the freedom to love who you love, no matter who it is, has been, you know, a theme in my life forever. And to look at the global situation now and the honestly backwards type of peddling that's going on in many countries, like in Hungary, for example, it's sort of astonishing to hear what's happened there. And, you know, these are mandates which are brought in, you know, even Margaret Thatcher's time when there was this sort of pr promotion of homosexuality was banned, even in the UK. But I mean, this was many years ago. You know, great strides have been made in the UK to be able to sort of rectify that. And ironically, by the Conservative government, even when it was the Conservatives that brought that in the first place. But it's it's honestly astounding to look at, like, where even are we? Like, what is going on in this day and age? We have so many other problems to really dig into and really, like, solve. And there is still so much like rules and implications for literally who you love. It's it's honestly baffling. And for me, that's why it's something that I'm I'm hugely like sort of pro campaigning for is that yeah, I honestly don't mind what the orientation is or who you love at the end of the day. Like it's about, it's hard enough to love in an environment, you know, where it's wholly acceptable to love whoever it is you love, let alone an environment where it's illegal or like, you know, a certain physical like acts are sort of punishable by death. I mean, it's honestly extraordinary. So that's why, like for me, actually, it's it's super important to push that as as a way of being. Something I do through my social media as well is really encouraging people to dare to feel and dare to show those feelings and express those feelings. And every time you do that in a public environment, you're giving permission for somebody else to do the same. Which is so very difficult for some people. Uh, totally. For many people, yeah. Uh, I, I really appreciated how um, we discover so many firsts with Sergey, uh, the first kiss. I, I won't reveal too much more, uh, um, but you found so many interesting moments um, that one would never think of as being sensual, like like the photo developing scene. Mm -hmm. it, it was just really, really lovely. Uh, was that in the original screenplay or were, there, were those things that you found um, during the filmmaking process? Well, the, the photo developing scene, for example, was actually taken and actually inspired by um, a real, uh, another man actually that we met who served during the, the army during that time. And he actually recounted uh, a story where he was developing photos with another sort of comrade and sort of like described this real um, sort of eroticism and in, in the sort of closeness of that like, proximity. And, you know, traditionally, there are certain places like where certain things won't typically happen. And also obviously there's the, there's a scene in the sea as well, which we didn't want to say too much about as well. But as a screenwriter, I was like also in that place of saying, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by like, for example, what 
um, Robert Mapplethorpe said about, I want to see something I've never seen before. Yeah. And like, that's really for me as a filmmaker, the kind of thing that I want to create is I want to see things that I haven't seen before in, in extraordinary and different ways. And so for myself as an actor, as well as that, why I like to be able to give a performance, which is not necessarily the way you'd expect it to be, um, to kind of challenge how we can react to certain situations, not go, oh, of course he's going to cry here. Oh, of course this is going to happen. But actually really like sort of play with how we can react to certain situations. No, no, very much so. As a writer myself, uh, you know, I, I, I completely understand. And I, I want to, because you mentioned that, I want to talk about the decision to do um, the film with light Russian accents, which mm. works so well. Um, I wrote a play called Lord about the persecution of gays in Russia, which bowed off Broadway here in New York. And we went the same route. We mm. did write light, uh, light Russian accents and it worked so well. And it was very validating to see it in the film because I thought it worked magnificently. I was wondering, was there a dialogue? Did you, it, it, was there ever any pressure on you to like, for instance, decide on British accents? Because we had people telling us, oh no, you guys should should make them uh, British accents or American accents instead. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I mean, there's been some, several iterations of this whole argument. I mean, you know, at one point, Peter and I were considering to shoot the film in Russian language. Of course. And, you know, that would have been, that would have been very well received, for example, at film festivals. <laughs> but at the same time, we really wanted, after a lot of discussion and a lot of with other producers and, and others of distribution as well, we decided that we wanted to shoot it in English so that the maximum amount of people could see it globally. That was a really sort of deciding factor for us. Um, because, you know, in the, in the UK alone, like foreign language film with subtitles makes up 1% of the box office. And so we were like, okay, let's just not, not even go there um, after that decision. So then of course it was, yeah, the next thing was like, do we do an accent or do we want to sort of do it in sort of standard RP English, which again, to me, like having seen sort of Gorky Park, when I sort of first started seeing that film, I was like going, well, you know, costumes and everything are amazing, but suddenly there's something a bit jarring about hearing everybody who's in a very British English. And just that's really just not to my taste and not to Peter's taste either. So we decided to, you know, invest um, a significant amount of time and money into a really excellent dialect coach, uh, Catherine Cholton, who worked with me and um, with Oleg and Diana and Jake and the rest of the principal cast as well to really find this um, sort of commonality of, of a sound whilst we're all from very different backgrounds, um, I feel that she did a really good job to be able to sort of bring us into the same sort of sounding world. And um, it was pretty challenging at first. And, you know, there was certainly different levels of Russian that I hit, like going very, very strong. And again, that's another pitfall as well, which, you know, so many films can sometimes make is that you have very strong accent, which can really interfere with the performance as well. You can kind of almost hang your performance on an accent yeah. um and so i'm really really grateful to working with her um for being able to sort of refine it to the level that we got it at that it felt enough further further enough away from me but not so far that it was something which felt sort of like forced or or very uncomfortable um or villainous it, yeah exactly because yeah, again yeah. We, of course we associate those certain sounds with with sort of certain sort of certain types of characters. And so, I mean, it was honestly, it's really, really, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, you sort of think it's the, the effective choice to have made as well. Very much so. Uh, I'm curious, how immersive an actor are you? Do you find yourself uh, bringing the character home with you or can you disengage pretty well? That's a really, that's a really interesting question because there were times on set where I almost felt something else sort of overtake me some sort of connection um to to the late sergey um and i would sometimes find myself sitting into a scene where i almost didn't have to do anything like not cog not not kind of go okay like now i'm going to work myself into this state uh sometimes i literally would just sort of sit into the scene like the scene for example again i won't spoil anything but the scene where sergey sits in the theater later on in the film um having found out uh, some news I didn't actually honestly do anything it, I just sort of sat into the scene and then it sort of started coming through me and again like having prepared heavily for that kind of way to be able to work 
that's the way that I love to be able to work is that I kind of do all the preparation I possibly can and then sort of stay open to the possibility to allow truth to kind of come out. Um, and so really that's a lot about my preparation as an actor is it's probably maybe in a more unusual way, but I do a lot of pre-work and then sort of almost throw everything away to be entirely in the moment. For me as an actor, it's super important just to, to go after the truth and nothing more than that. Um, and not kind of bring too much of an agenda to it, but actually just make the situation truthful and uh, well, as truthful as I can. So I hope that uh, that kind of comes through in, in some moments. I, I, honest, I honestly think um, your best friend was the close up in this film, seriously. Uh, there, was, there was just something about the camera just lingering on your face and what your face told us that the dialogue didn't need to. So kudos to you for that. Um, speak a bit about the look, the period, capturing uh, the military reality, uh, which uh, to me felt super authentic. Well, um, both both Peter and I, and we really are the co-creators of this film. You know, both both him and I have done so many different job roles through the process that you know we we're not sort of interested in having the credit for, but but really just sort of like being able to immerse. And we both made the decision that we wanted to have a world and create a world which were sort of tighter uniforms than they would have been, more flattering, um, more colorful world, sort of a more auric like awe like or sense of all world that um that the soviet union had and we sort of wanted to show it through the eyes of a 20 year old boy like i sergey's age um looking at this sort of machine this military machine and sort of like the color because you know a lot of films have chosen to show the soviet period it's very bleak very gray very kind of like dull but we decided to make a very different sort of choice in that regard and that she kind of make it vibrant and passionate and and you know really in keeping with the russians as people i deeply deeply love how russians are as people and you know i've been really lucky to hang out with a lot of russians during this process and they really know how to feel they really know how to sort of express and be able to uh, be very authentic in their feelings and so that's what we really brought to the design element and the coloring element to the film as well. And, and, and so kind of keeping this, this sort of thriller element, which, which I actually, as, as the screenwriter, was really pushing for, was to kind of have it, have some sequences in the film which make it feel like we're actually in the environment that it's set, as opposed to just the, the aesthetic, but actually the situations that we have. So the couple of military situations that unfold, um, really are to kind of give us maximum believability, believability and immersion into that world. That's actually a great link to my next question because there's a, a, a feeling of paranoia in the film uh, that one can strangely relate to mm. today since we seem to be returning to an age where everybody needs to be careful about what they say, what they do, because somebody might rat, I mean tweet, I mean rat you out. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah so, you know, I mean, you, you could not have imagined that 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 would have been um, something that would have been relatable in the film, but it is there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that, again, that's been something that, you know, I've, I've watched this, this, this film more times than I can ever possibly remember through having been through so many different um, elements of the filmmaking. But but it's been amazing to sort of see it with audiences who are beginning to sort of report back to us that they just go, you know, there's this constant feeling that something bad is going to happen. Constant, this sort of feeling that, you know, some, somebody's going to come in. And, and, you know, I think that as a, as somebody who is not loving in the conventional way, you kind of always are having to look over your shoulder. And I think that, you know, as you've said very well, that that's really the situation which so many people are living in. You know, like to be able to walk down the street and just hold hands with the person that you love and not feel persecuted in like your environment. Like we're talking about a basic human right to be able to express love genuinely and feel safe to do that. And I think that again, every time somebody does that, they give the permission for somebody else to do the same. And and it's amazing to look at, you know, even the most 
tolerant societies in the world to go, there is still these underlying, um, this underlying sort of like tension, which just doesn't need to be there and really shouldn't be there. Yeah. And um, I think that again, like I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in sort of being that change, um, being the, the change that you want to see. And so, you know, wherever possible, um, you know, I've been speaking about and encouraging what, look, whatever the circumstance is, whatever you want to see more of, demonstrate the behaviors and the example of the change that you want to see, because it gives permission for other people to do the same. And so I really do hope that this film brings up and highlights those elements that are existing with our own societies right now and and, and just being like a little bit more tolerant, a little more, not even tolerance, but let's not let's actually just put it out there. It's not tolerance, it's not putting up with, it's about accepting, just yeah. like that's the way the stuff is. Yeah, abs absolutely. So is it true that you're now living in Estonia? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually uh, moved there full time actually because of the pandemic situation. Wow. <laughs> and like I formed like a real love for the country uh, while I was there filming. And yeah, I'm now I'm now fully based there and I'm getting a little bit itchy feet, but I think <laughs> but that's also just because I want to make more films. And like, you know, the film business is actually it is building actually there, which is really amazing. And the, and the Baltic countries are really embracing a, a whole new sort of level of filmmaking. But yeah, for me, I, I'm sort of hungry to keep on making more films. So, and I know that a lot of that is going on in the UK right now. Yeah, yeah, big time. Well, well, you're you're lucky. You can just go wherever you want, basically. Um, so, what has been the react? I mean, I know the film has played in film festivals all over the world, including Russia. Uh, mm. What has been the reaction so far? Um, yeah, it, it, it's honestly like quite surprising to have. Um, I mean, you know, we, we submitted to the Moscow International Film Festival, never, ever, ever believing that we would be uh, accepted. And um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty interesting set of circumstances. I mean, 93 of the 92 press articles which were written about fiber during the festival were, of course, inherently negative. Um, and, you know, we had a letter which was sent to the state project prosecution office um after the first screening that went ahead there saying that this festival this film should be removed from the festival um and then actually during the second screening uh there were actually people uh protesting outside of the cinema and then we had also the the tickets effectively revoked for everybody who we were sending to the second screening and so pretty much the second screening played to an empty cinema um, which was kind of astonishing, actually. So we weren't officially kicked out, but we were, I guess you could say, silenced, um, which was you know, which was really like upsetting to hear. And we actually were honestly really grateful that they accepted us and thought, you know, there's this great strides being made here and potentially this is a, a new situation unfolding um, with some sort of greater acceptance, you know, around that community in, in, in Russia. And... Uh, it was it was honestly like heartbreaking to to find out that actually the film was sort of treated in such a way and and people got turned away uh, from from the screening which was unfortunate but you know then then sort of by by uh, opposition when we were in um, we were in Frameline in San Francisco we were really grateful to be received with such a uh, reciprocating audience and you know a, a very long standing ovation at the end of it. Um, both Peter and I were a bit sort of like, well, did we make something that people actually liked? As opposed to, because it was the first time we'd ever sat with a live audience um, with the film. So it was, uh, it was, it was very, it's been very um, humbling to have had honestly both experiences, both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, don't go by Russia. Things uh, aren't, haven't improved there. Um, I want to ask a tricky question. Uh, I know it's, it's wonderful to be playing LGBTQ festivals. Uh, and it gets you great exposure, but is there any fear or trepidation about the film being pigeonholed and limiting it from mainstream exposure? That's something that we're, we're actively trying to um, manage with the film distribution because, you know, the, the audiences are speaking for themselves and saying that there is a much wider scope of like who the film appeals to. And it's been one of the biggest challenges is actually having distribution 
see that that capability as well because you know so often people want to be able to box something into something very uh very known or very regular and um that's been honestly one of the hardest things to do because we know that the film has like much greater scope than than within the community which is not to say that our community is not amazingly supportive like who are following the film but i mean that like there is a greater scope and yeah so we're we're actively looking to continue to sort of grow the outreach and right now we're in conversations with you know our future marketing team to be able to help build that openness um of the sort of multiple threads of the story and and relatability to it so yeah i mean we're we're sort of doing everything we can really to to do that but we we certainly don't want to limit our audiences because you know there's a lot to be experienced like in the film um on many different levels so yeah that that's really a, a big sort of priority for us and as you said it's we're super grateful to be accepted at the festivals but we're continuing also to apply to many of the other festivals which you know are, are sort of f- for the more mainstream but it's frustrating because last year Ammonite was a, a, an extraordinary film that you know should have broken through and didn't and i think the last film that did was the imitation game which yeah. of course had Weinstein behind it. We don't want to talk about uh, him necessarily, but I think a lot of that also had to do with the fact that it was a safe film, mm-hmm. uh, and um, I think you know that's that's kind of really a shame. I, I can go on and on about that, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> tricky question number two is: Do you find it odd to have to navigate questions about sexual orientation since you just played a man who loved men? I know it shouldn't matter, but the American press and I think sometimes the British press love to go there well at the end of the day it's it's kind of really more of the kind of question of of why like and for me like as an actor and i think for you know many actors sort of are on the sort of same page with this is that the trouble is the more you know about me <laughs> the less the less you will be able to per se believe what i can do if that makes sense it does and so you know, I, I think it it's really in, let's not bring up any particular person like within the sort of recent um, press, but you know, whether you're into eating other human beings or, you know, anything else, the, the trouble is then, you know, it risks your your potential for, for casting. It's not to say that I want to, I want to not say anything specifically in order to, to not be able to, or to be able to play certain roles, but I believe it is my responsibility as an actor to, leave everything as open as possible so that you can believe what I do is is the sort of is the truth and as I said earlier that for me is always the most important uh to serve the story and to serve the story in the most truthful way possible so more often than not like for you, I'll just go the question really is like why and I go like is it why why is it do you know what I mean so I, I know exactly what you mean and I actually like the way you've been navigating it Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> I do. I that's really good, do. So. Yeah. I think I think that you know also the more specific we are about things in our life, we can also cut ourselves off for other experiences which are unex- unexpected. And I'm a great believer in expect the unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. Um tell them two more quick questions. Uh, Tell me a bit about your early history as an actor. Um, We know your big break came with Theory of Everything and Kingsman. Uh, You got your start on stage after RADA, is that correct? Uh, That's right, yeah. So I trained at RADA um, at the Royal Academy in London, and then I actually uh, left acting school, not really wanting to be an actor anymore. Uh, And that's actually when I started writing. So I began my sort of writing process as a result of my actor's training. Um, which kind of led me back into then doing a little bit of extra training um, in England, which ended in the West End season. And so I went basically from a West End season of doing three plays uh, in a sort of repertory sort of rotation at the same time, um, and then straight into into those movies. And for me, like I, I sort of love all the different elements of, of you know, this this business per se, but I do deeply love filmmaking. Like there's just something so magical about about it and and i continue to love to be able to do all elements of it because i love like so many different facets of of the filmmaking process including sort of like the music and with it within the editing and you know i i know for sure that i'm going to be 
making more films and intend to do so and in, in multiple different ways. But, you know, I, I simply do love acting as well. And uh, what is up next for you, Tom? What uh, are you, uh, is there anything acting wise that we can see you in coming up? Um, there are a couple of conversations, the interesting conversations like going on right now about uh, projects, but I'm not really allowed to speak about it. But okay. also as a writer as well, I can say that there are three, at least three projects in, in the sort of writing process, which I'm like actively uh, creating and um, a couple of which I'm sure actually Peter and I will be doing again. So we really hope to be able to be working as a creative team again, because I think, you know, the, the symbiosis is really, really fantastic. Well, if Firebird is any example, then uh, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, thank you for taking the time out. Um, I, I wish you lots of broken limbs on this. Uh, and Thanks, on behalf Beth. of Edge Media Network, um, I thank you again. Thank you so uh, much.